The Aussie woman scaring the Western propaganda machine. Coming up on Citizens Insight. Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series on matters of national and international importance. My name is Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by a very special guest who I'm thrilled to have in the studio here, Jack James. Welcome Jack. Thank you. And Jack, you are the Aussie woman scaring the Western war propaganda machine, which is why we're having this interview, which I think is one of the more interview, important interviews the Citizens Insight has ever done. But um, let's unfold this as we go through the next uh, the period of time in this discussion. First, a little bit of context before I introduce Jack. Regular viewers of Citizens Party shows will be aware that um, last month I was turfed out of a public meeting because I was asking questions related to the claims of Uyghur forced labour in Xinjiang in China. And the questions I asked were asked in cooperation with Jack James here. And I was waving around a report, which we're going to talk about in this interview. Um, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute's Uyghurs for Sale report, scholarly analysis or strategic disinformation that Jack is the author of. Um, and the reason it was a big deal is because, like in, in terms of the timing, is because uh, everyone was anticipating the release of the uh, United Nations Office for the High Commissioner of Refugees, uh, sorry, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights report on claims about um, Xinjiang and the way China treats the Uyghurs. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, attention on it and this was something that we experienced together. Now, um, Jack, in my view, is one of the most qualified people to talk on this issue because of her experience and because of the work she's done. And I want the viewer to understand that, Jack, the way that I've come to appreciate. Um, but first, let's talk about you and your experience, because I think this is an, a very important part of the story, and how you came to be in this position where you've taken this up as pretty much a lone voice, mm -hmm. right? Um, you and I are collaborating now, and, which is great, but you, this is this, this like a bonus. You've taken this up as a cause mm -hmm. because of your situation. Um, and what you thought you could offer to counter the propaganda that you saw. One of your qualifications is that you know China because you work there. So tell us how that came about. Okay, so um, maybe about a decade ago, I uh, was very keen to do a gap year anywhere in the world. And researching online, I narrowed it down to either Georgia or China. And English teaching seemed to be the easiest occupation to enter. Um, I didn't have any particular interest or, or knowledge about either country other than I was just looking for an easy way to enter another country. And through a pro and con list, I narrowed it down to China and I went online looking for a recruitment agent. And this recruitment agent that I found, the first job that she put me forward for was with a Chinese military university. Hmm. Um, and I wasn't interested in that. Um, growing up in Australia, watching ABC News in particular, uh, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, is presented in a very negative light. Yes. Um, so for that reason, I wasn't interested. But also, around this time, we were seeing um, a, the media spotlight on the Australian Defence Force Academy and the problems with misogyny and okay, sexual yep, assaults yep. and sexual harassment. And I figured that, oh, this is a, a common culture everywhere in, in all military institutions, mm. not just Australian institutions. So they were the two reasons why I was not interested in the role. But the recruiter kept pestering me and said, just go for the interview. So I agreed. And uh, I spoke with the captain there. and. I explained to him my concerns, particularly the second concern, yeah. uh, that I'm just afraid that I could be exposed to sexual harassment or sexual assault, because that's what happens at the Australian Defence Force Academy. And the guy just kept laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And um, what did that mean? Well, I, I didn't appreciate that he was laughing at me because I wanted him to take my concern seriously. Yeah. But then he explained, no, 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 that's just Australia. It's not China. That's what happens over there. It doesn't happen here. And I didn't believe him. And I repeated myself. And he said, yeah, we know about that. We know that happens in the Australian Defence Force Academy. It doesn't happen here in the PLA. We respect our women. You'll be safe. You'll be fine. So I was intrigued by that. And, uh, you know, he put my concerns um, aside. And then um, I had to deal with the first concern, which was the ethics of working for the PLA. Yep. And at this stage, I had just come out of a Master's of Public Policy with the Australian National University. And part of my studies was um, public sector whistleblowers and how they're victimised by the system. And through my studies, I had uncovered uh, this really uh, p pernicious and disturbing form of victimisation, which was compulsorily referring whistleblowers to psychiatric examinations under the Public Service Act. And I had no idea that this was occurring until I was speaking to victims of this. So they blow, they blow the whistle and then it's, they're made to go and see a psychologist? Uh, as a way to discredit their yeah. mind, which yeah. would therefore discredit yeah. their complaints. This is a practice in Australia you uncovered. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was in my mid-twenties at that stage. I had no idea that we had this Soviet-style retribution of whistleblowers who we should be worshipping as heroes. And I was, I was very disillusioned at that stage coming out of the degree to find out what was happening. Because some of these whistleblowers, or you'd speak to their families, they went on to commit suicide. Yeah, 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 they, they just yeah. couldn't handle the victimisation. So my thinking at the time was, I prefer to work for an institution that wasn't pretending to be something that it wasn't, yeah. than for an institution here in Australia that was pretending to be democratic and fair and humane. So um, not long after, I, I went to China and... Uh, so the irony is, you go to China partly motivated by uncovering human rights abuses in Australia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could exactly describe it as that, yeah. <laughs> um, but you see, when we have social problems mm. in Australia, we don't necessarily use the term human rights no, abuse. That's of course not. usually reserved for China yep. um, or other global South nations. Um, but yeah, I went to the PLA and uh, it was just an extraordinary experience. I was not expecting that the students I would have would be some of the most uh, loving, um, curious, and kindest human beings I've ever known in my life. So you, this was a um, this was something that challenged your assumptions because you you still you still had these assumptions when you went to China. Yeah. And your experience was very different than what you assumed you would experience. Yeah, I thought I was entering a twenty first century gulag. Yeah. And it was nothing like that. Um, Even in the PLA yes. training academy. Yes, I felt like I was at Woodstock. I know that, so I know that sounds peculiar. <laughs> yes. But <laughs> these students were so pro-peace, um, so pro-harmony, pro-unity. It was a mantra that was constantly repeated. Right. They looked at the world through those lenses. Um, and you, you wouldn't expect it from a military institution of all things, but that's how it was. And um, uh, more broadly, outside of the, the, the PLA uh, training, English teaching that you did, did was, you, was your experience of broader China similar, that you found it different than you anticipated? The first day I arrived, I thought I was going to see millions of unhappy faces. Right. And it was the opposite. Everyone seemed as happy as we are in Australia. Um, by the end of the, my first week in China, it just felt like I was as free as I was in Australia. Um, so of course that was a surprise to me. Wow. Because I was taught the opposite, watching the ABC. Yeah. Um, by the end of my year there, the first year there, I'd come to the conclusion that I was actually freer in China than I am in Australia. Okay, explain that, elaborate on that. Yeah. What made you think that? Um, there's, there's various reasons why I felt freer, but I'll just focus on yeah, one freedom, yeah. which is a human right, yeah. which is freedom of movement. Yeah. So 
as a female, uh, a young female, I felt like I could go more places on my own, um, particularly at night time. I could go down dark alleys, I could catch um, taxis on my own and I, and I never felt unsafe. Whereas um, back here in Australia, and I've talked with this with other female expats in yeah. China, we talked about when we lived back in our Western countries, if we were on our own at night, we would be holding our keys, getting ready to stab someone just in <laughs> case someone yeah, hurts yeah, yeah. us. Um, there was never a sense that the Australian government really cared if something happened to us on the streets. That's just a private issue. You go to court and you deal with it. In China, it felt like it was women's safety in public was taken very seriously. Yeah. And it, there was a premium placed on it. And I'll give you an example. Didi, which is China's uh, Uber yeah. service, um, they had a situation where a man had raped and killed a female passenger. And Beijing immediately said after that, one more instance like this, there's going to be consequences. Now, I can't imagine something like that being said in Australia. Mm. It would just be sent to the court system. Uh, a couple of months later, something similar occurred, and the Chinese government said, Beijing said, that's it. Your nighttime license is cancelled. Only licensed taxis will be operating at night time. And I hadn't heard of a similar incident since. So they di there's a problem, they actually deal with it, and the and because they're proactive like that, society is safer mm -hmm. and you feel more freedom. Yeah, and, and it was something that growing up in Australia, uh, freedom and human rights was equated to free speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, over there, I realised I don't really need free speech as much as journalists tell me I need it. But I really do need freedom of movement yeah. so I can get around and engage in uh, visits and exercises that I find more self-fulfilling yeah. than exercising free that speech. Said, that said, on the free speech thing, um, Chinese people are not shy in telling the, their immediate authorities what they think of them <laughs> if, if, there's a, if, if, if they're not happy, right? They certainly Absolutely. express themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, as we go on, I can reveal more stories to yeah, you yeah. about that. Yeah, good. Um, so let's go back to the PLA thing because you have an interesting insight I'd like you to elaborate on. The viewer, the average Australian viewer, would share your initial um, prejudice that, oh, being somehow associated with the PLA, that's a negative on you, right? You don't see it as a negative. In fact, you see it as giving you um, a, a pretty in unique insight into how China works. So just elaborate on that, what your thoughts on why the PLA was a positive experience for you. Yeah, I think it's important that we have um, Australians inside these institutions understanding how they actually operate. Yep. Otherwise, what we get back here is mythology. Um, but I just, if I can, I'd like to share some stories okay. um, of my Please. time in yep. the PLA so people can understand the benefit of gaining knowledge yes. from the inside, but also the benefit of planting an Australian in there to oh. spread soft power to oh. the PLA. So there's, there's those on. two arms. Are you coming out in our show as an agent for Australian foreign influence in China? My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get back to China, so don't call me that. <laughs> All right, that is a joke. <laughs> um, so my f in my first month, I was asked at the very last minute on a Sunday night to take over someone's class on Monday morning at 8 a.m. And all I was told was that the class is on the topic of architecture. And I had to come up with <laughs> a, a, a one and a half hour lesson right. on this. And before I'd left Australia, I remembered that SBS Dateline had played a video, uh, a story about ghost cities. Yes. So I went online, I downloaded it, I took it there the next morning, not really thinking too much about the content. Uh, my intention was to play it and then have a general discussion about it. And uh, as, as it was playing to the students, uh, the journalist, I think it was Mark Davis, was saying more and more critical things about the Chinese government. Okay. And remember, I've been propagandised in the West that you can't criticise the Chinese government. Yes, yes. 
and I'm getting more and more nervous sitting there at the front of the class watching this video, hearing Mark Davis being more and more critical of the Chinese government. And as time went on, uh, the criticism was becoming more severe. It was getting to the point where I wanted to start crying <laughs> and I was holding back tears because I'm thinking... What have I done? I'm thinking um, either they're going to sack me today and send me back home or I'm going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'm sitting there thinking, how, how do I problem solve with this? What do I do to get myself out of this, this problem? And I said, I don't know, um, at the end, I'll just act nonchalant and just make a little comment and then move on to the next topic. Yeah. And everyone will forget, will forget about it, hopefully. And so that's what happened at the end. I was like, oh yeah, so that's, that's the video. What did everyone think? And everyone's hands shut up and I thought I was about to be attacked. Yeah. And it was the opposite. All the students were agreeing with the journalists and, and going further in their criticisms of the Chinese government. One by one, I'd point to each student. And I was just on the inside jumping for joy because I'm thinking, my God, these students, they're not brainwashed. The youth of China are not brainwashed. They can think for themselves. The youth of the PLA future mm -hmm. Officers, yes. you're talking about. Yes. Criticising their own government <laughs> in a PLA university. With a camera, With in, a the, camera in, the <laughs> in the corner of the room. And, um, and their thoughts were just so insightful and, and intelligent and there was no fear in them to express these criticisms. And that was a major wake-up call for me, that everything that I heard about China and the PLA in Australia simply wasn't true. Um, wow. So that's one misconception, major misconception that I had. Let me remind the viewer: corrected. this is you're you're an Australian who's gone there with, you know, no particular you know agenda necessarily. You don't not, you're not there to be pro-China. You're just there to have your gap year. You yeah. Ha you have this experience, and you're, this is what you're experiencing, right? This is not filtered people. This is Jack's experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another example. Um, I was there roughly for three years, and over that time, my students would always refer to Australia as a friend. Yeah. But I never really believed it. I just thought they're being polite. They just want me to feel welcome. Okay. Um, but then in 2016, I'd shared, a, a, I'd brought an article, I think it was from the Canberra Times, about how the PLA had invented a long range missile that could reach Canberra. And do Canber Canberrans need to be afraid now that the PLA's got this capability? And I shared that article with my students in class, getting ready for just a, a general calm discussion. And to my surprise, the whole room went into a panic, a frenzied panic, and everyone was speaking loudly in Chinese really fast, and I couldn't understand anything that anyone was saying, and I was trying to make sense of what was going on, like my heart was beating, I, I couldn't understand. And then finally one of my students turned to me, practically with tears in his eyes, saying, but teacher, we thought Australia was our friend. And I said, you're kidding, right? You don't realise that this is what we all grew up, I grew up with this, we all grew up with this type of news, you didn't know that? And everyone solemnly shook their head. And They um, were shocked that we see them as a threat. And hurt, like, and hurt, because the yeah, yeah. the article is saying that these these people in these room in this room are capable of do, of killing Australians. Um, of course, that wasn't going to sit well with them. Um, and I had to make a decision then and there because I was thinking, well, for some reason, their superiors, the people in charge, have not told them about how the PLA in China is portrayed back in Australia. Right. Who am I to to tell them how they're really received back yeah. there. So I decided to end class early and, and not reveal that um, and just leave it to the wisdom of their superiors. But that, again, was another wake-up call. Like, mm. I was there long enough to know that they weren't a threat, but in that moment, it really crystallised that not only were they not a threat, it offended them greatly to yeah. be portrayed that way. Oh, that's a, that amazing anecdotes. Can I just also add a third yes. anecdote? Keep them coming. Um, when I'm talking about bringing Australian soft power into yeah, the yeah, PLA. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
there's, there's a lot of examples of this, but um, one of them that I enjoyed the most was I liked playing Australian songs for my students. All right, yeah. And I learnt that my students particularly uh, developed a taste for Paul Kelly. They really liked okay. his songs. Um, but they really liked from little things, big, big things, things grow. grow. And they loved the story of Gough Whitlam with the sand oh, and okay. Vincent Lignari's hand. Yeah. And I had the picture up there and explaining the whole history of it. And um, then I, then we all started singing it, gave them the, the lyrics. And um, as, I'm, as I'm watching them sing it, it was such a surreal moment because in, in class they're always in their uniforms. And I'm standing there thinking, I'm just a lone Australian that's gotten into the PLA yeah. and I'm getting a whole bunch of PLA soldiers <laughs> singing an Australian <laughs> song. Um, it was a really surreal moment that I never thought I would ever experience. And um, I, afterwards I called one of my Aboriginal friends back home and I told him what happened and what a strange experience it felt. But it was also one that brought me pride and it brought him pride. Um, he was so glad that I shared that song and the story oh, with my good. students. Um, the students loved it so much that even a week after that class, as I was going through the campus, I would be hearing people <laughs> singing little the song. things, yeah, big things grow. That's right. Advertising superannuation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, another example of bringing Australian soft power into the PLA uh, was that they were very, very curious about our political system. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught them about the theory, not the practice, because I wanted to present the, the good side, side <laughs> the best side of Australia. And um, I talked to them about the separation of powers, um, which they found fascinating. I talked to them about free speech and all the philosophical justifications for that and all of the Enlightenment thinkers that we turn to, uh, such as uh, J.S. Mills and John Locke. They were busy taking notes. It was um, the most engaged they'd ever been for that particular class. And afterwards, um, when I was doing private, tutor private tutorials about a week later, some of my students came with J.S. Mills and John Locke's books that they got from the library, and they wanted to speak to me about it, saying this concept of free speech is so fascinating. We want it for China too. So books on free speech in China aren't banned. Uh, well, no, no well not, at, not in the PLA not at the least. PLA. I haven't repeated this ex experiment <laughs> elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. But it was surprising to me though because you hear about censorship and, yeah, and whatnot. Yeah. I didn't see it there. Mm. Um, well, that's a very positive experience. I do want to ask you about a more negative one. China suffered an intense wave of terrorism which was particularly bad in the decade from 2007 to 2016 and that covers the period that you were there. Mm -hmm. What did you experience relating to that? I didn't know anything about it when I first went to China, but soon, just through making friends with the Chinese and talking to them, I, I knew that terrorism and extremism was a problem in Xinjiang. Um, at that stage, I think Xinjiang, because it, it is an autonomous region, it was seen as a bit of a, an enclave, an economic enclave, and a cultural enclave. Yeah. The Han majority didn't really feel like it was part of China. Um, whatever social pr or economic problems were going on there, that was just Xinjiang's problem, yeah. not ours. I, I think what really woke everyone up to the problem of terrorism was when it spilled over the borders right. into other provinces. Um, there were stabbings in Guangzhou, there were stabbings in Changsha where I lived, and there were st massive stabbings in Kunming. Um, as an example of what happened in Changsha, uh, my understanding was that a Uyghur had started randomly stabbing people on the streets. And we were immediately, all of us foreign teachers, because there was a lot of us there, were immediately locked into our apartments and told not to leave. At the same time, my father had been visiting and he was going back to the, uh, to the airport to go home. And he knew something was wrong because every 
toll booth that he was passing through in front of his eyes was being converted to a military checkpoint mm. again and again and again. It turns out that he went to the airport on the wrong day, so he came back <laughs> and we had two sides of the story to, to match up and right. I explained to him what had happened on the streets. And we realized that what had happened was they didn't realize that this was a lone wolf attack. Um, they thought that it could be coordinated yep. and they reacted in response to that. And that just goes to show um, how seriously I think the Chinese government yeah. takes terrorism. So once it spills over the border, something was going to happen in Xinjiang. They were yeah. going to have to do something about the root of um, the root problem. Um, but also, there there are many times that I, because I'm half Persian, and I also have Iraqi heritage because my mother was born in Iraq. Um, and she's a Muslim, I was very much drawn to Xinjiang right. because I could see that there were similarities in my mother's culture yeah. and the Xinjiang culture. And I always wanted to go there. But my mother, who would watch uh, Arabic and Persian news regularly, would tell me, don't go. Like She, she would be seeing in the news. They were reporting this in, in Arabic and Persian news. The terrorism uh, in Xinjiang. Yeah, well, at least what she was watching online. Yeah, right. okay. She was learning about this. And, and because she's a Shia Muslim, not a Sunni Muslim, mm. and Xinjiang is predominantly Sunni, Sunni. Yep. she was begging me, like, if you do go, do not mention <laughs> that you're from a Shia family. Um, so right. She was really afraid for, for my safety. Um, so to placate her, I, I didn't go. Right. Um, but there was a, another time when I was flirting with the idea, and I was mentioning it to some friends. And one of my students who had since graduated um, from the PLA found out that I was trying to get in there to work. And um, he contacted me and he said, look, I don't know if you know this, but since I graduated, I've been stationed in Xinjiang and it's not safe for you to come yet. Just, just wait a couple more years until we get this under control. So it was a real problem and through various inputs I learned about it. Yep and yourself experienced how it affected society. Mm, correct. Um, any other observations from your time in China? Um, I'll share two stories that just warm my heart, okay. but they're, they're common stories. They, they happen on a daily or, or weekly basis, and this is why I want Australians to go to China. Um, so, uh, one time I was going into a new restaurant, it was a Muslim restaurant, and I was a little bit nervous because there were a lot of food stations and I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do, <laughs> how I was supposed to order. Right. And there was a young waitress that could see that I was hesitant and she came over and brought me in. She was really sweet and she set down the, the plates and brought over a fork and a knife. And she thought I didn't know how to use chopsticks. Right. <laughs> and I explained to her, uh, it's okay, I know how to use chopsticks, but thank you so much. It was really kind of you to consider that. Um, I was so touched by that mm -hmm. that um, I wanted to show my appreciation by leaving a tip. Right. But you're not supposed to leave tips in, in China. They're very anti-tip. It's seen as charity. Right, okay. Um, so I thought, I'll, I'll be sneaky and I'll hide five yuan under the plate. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, as I, was, as I was leaving, I'd finished, I was leaving, and I just pointed to the girl to just cl clean up and waved goodbye. And because I knew if she saw the five UN, she'd give it back to me, I sprinted. <laughs> I ran out the door, I ran down the street, pretty sure I was fast enough to get away from her. Maybe about a minute later, I felt a tap on oh. my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> And I turned around and the girl's holding out five <laughs> one UN notes, trying to give it back to me. And um, <laughs> she explained to me that um, she understands that in my culture, that yeah. tipping is the normal thing to do, but she can't accept it because it's not acceptable in her culture. Okay. And um, wow. I said, I know that. This, this is all in Chinese. I said, I know that, but my Chinese is not great. And you don't know how moved I was by you just, it's, it might seem small to you, but by you offering me a fork and knife, I was moved by that. And I, 
I'm not articulate enough to express my gratitude. So all I've got is a little bit of money to give you. Can you please accept it as a token of my appreciation? And by this stage, a, a crowd oh. was gathering around us because it was, I was in an area where it was very rare to see foreigners. Right. And, um, and she said, okay, I'll accept it on one condition, that you give me a hug. Oh. And so we hugged each other on the street and I think everyone had tears in oh their eyes. Goodness. Like we were, we were, Both of us were just moved by the moment. And um, so those things are, are quite commonplace yeah. for me. My dad had similar experiences. Um, one time he was going through the T Mountains and uh, he, it was starting to rain, but dad didn't care about that. He was happy to walk in the rain. And uh, a guy was on his bike and had, was going up the mountain and had passed dad. And then a minute later, he'd come back and dad wasn't sure what was going on. And the guy gets off his bike, opens up his boot, and pulls out an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> and walks over, over to my dad, saying, you know, here. My dad can't speak Chinese, so he yeah, can't yeah. communicate. Yeah. And dad's saying, no, no, I don't, I don't need one. I'm fine. Um, I can walk in the rain. And the man wasn't understanding it. Right. Um, so dad opened up his bag and showed him that he's got an umbrella. And the man's confused. It's like, he didn't... He's got one, he just didn't yeah. want to use it. And the man's looking at him all confused. And dad's signaling to him, like, this is beautiful, I love walking in the rain. And then he finally got it. Uh, and he starts laughing at him and, and then shakes his <laughs> hand and, and, and goes off and goes back riding. And, and dad was so moved by that because it was a complete stranger. Mm. Um, dad wasn't Chinese, yeah. he was a Westerner. And yet this man, cared about his well-being enough to, to come back round and to give him his yeah. umbrella. Oh, that's amazing. Well, so just before you come back to Australia, what years were you in China? On and off from 2013 to 2019. Okay. So when you returned, or started to return, I suppose, um, did you notice any changes in Australia vis-a-vis -vis China and the attitudes towards China? Um, yeah, I think what was most striking for me is that in the early days when I was in China, uh, when I would tell people or my friends would tell people that I worked for the PLA, there was this curiosity. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. Tell me more. In 2020 onwards, if I mentioned it, um, people would look down and look around and <laughs> pretend that I wasn't there, like they couldn't see me. They just didn't, they were so afraid to speak to me about it, to the point where I just don't even mention it anymore. Um, so clearly... Well, we'll, keep, we'll keep this between us then. <laughs> 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 clearly the propaganda campaign has worked. Yeah, People are that. afraid. Well, yeah. that brings me to, I think, so we're going to cover two more subjects in, mm -hmm. this, in this discussion, but this one is quite revealing because you you saw something on television that you were uniquely positioned to uh, be suspicious about mm -hmm. and then you acted mm -hmm. and I think this is something that I want I want people to pay special attention to this part of the discussion because you watched a 2017 Four Corners episode called Power and Influence um, this was the in probably the first big investigative report in the Australian media that made the big allegations that China was secretly inter interfering in Australia. And this, this was 2017. So the, there's a famous book called Silent Invasion by Clive Hamilton. That was published the following year. Mm -hmm. And that made all these wild allegations as well. So this was, it's very significant that this came first. And it was um, a joint effort between the ABC and the Sydney Morning Herald or the Fairfax Papers. Um, and the presenter was Nick McKenzie. You watched it and you noticed that something didn't add up. What was it? Please tell this story. Because I'd worked in the PLA, I'd gotten a sense for, just a small sense for how intelligence work happens. And what I knew was that they don't go and send spies into another country who can't speak English properly <laughs> right. and admit on public television that they're spies for the Chinese government. <laughs> the rest of Australia thought that happened. I knew that it didn't. 
the students that I presumed, my students that I presumed had gone into intelligence work, and it's an assumption, it was never confirmed, mm. were the most articulate and most intelligent students that I had. Yeah. So when this young girl on Four Corners is seemingly confessing to be a spy for the Chinese embassy and reporting students for engaging in anti-communist party protests, I knew something wasn't right. Either this girl was confessing to something she didn't do, and I don't know why, or her interview had been cut and spliced to make it look like she was confessing to something that she doesn't actually do. So we're talking about a girl named Lupin Lu, who is a student at the Australian National University. Uh, University of Canberra. Sorry, the University of Canberra. And she gives this interview to Nick McKenzie and you see her look like she's confessing to being a spy on Australian television, which mm -hmm. was one of the two main features of this show. Which attracted a whole lot of harassment from Australians targeted at her. Oh, um, absolutely. Because it was would. so shocking. It sure. was so sh it, was, it seemed so cold and callous to watch that yeah. on television. So you then decided to get involved and you assisted Lupin Lou in... Well, first of all, you, got, you found out her side of the story and then you assisted her in taking legal action against the ABC. So mm -hmm. just explain what she told you and then how the legal action worked. Um, when I found her, um, I just wanted to help her clear her name. I wasn't really thinking about helping her launch a legal action. Yeah. And I just said, we just have to get your full interview and play it and then people are going to leave you alone. Because she told you that she hadn't said what no, Four Corners presented no. her as saying. Well, she was adamant that she didn't say what Four Corners said she'd said, but she couldn't remember what she'd said. Uh, so I said to her, let's try and get your full interview and, and play it online to clear your name so that the harassment can stop. Um, but the ABC wouldn't give the, uh, the footage to her. Right. And um, I'd previously worked for the government and I worked in the Freedom of Information section so I, I knew that we couldn't FOI the ABC because um, it's not a government department and so I contacted a lawyer to see if there was anything else that we could do, a lawyer that I knew and when I explained the story to her she was so incensed by what happened she begged me to give the case to her, she wanted to run a defamation action and so through Lupin's lawyer, we got a transcript from the ABC, just excerpts, they wouldn't give mm. us the whole thing. But what was fascinating was that Lupin Lu had actually effectively said the opposite of what Four Corners said she said. So three times she denied being a proxy for the Chinese embassy and every time she said that it was edited out. Are you serious? Yeah, I've, I've got the transcript up on a blog, we can, we can add the link. But uh, yeah, I was just as shocked as well. But now that I tell the story, it's just become a, a mundane story because now we're seeing far worse yeah, propaganda yeah, yeah, today yeah. than how it was back then. Um, so uh, there was another thing that she said which was peculiar because I said to her, you kept saying that you cared about the safety of the students. What were you afraid was going to happen to them? What did you mean by that? Which is what a journalist should have asked, but it yeah. didn't happen. And she said, well, every time you watch television and you see a protest, there's violence and people get hurt and, or they die. And I said, no, that's not a protest, that's a riot. Do you know the difference? And she said, no. She just thought all protests were riots. And that's why she said she would mention it to the embassy for the safety of the students. Right. Um, that was such important context um, you know, to someone as an, speaking English as a second language that the journalist at the time should have elicited from her, but didn't. Um, if you look at the actual transcript, you could see that um, he's asking the same question again and again because he's hoping that she'll change the words to fit his narrative. Which is, to me, particularly insidious because journalists sometimes ask the same question again and again because they're badgering a politician or something. He's talking to somebody whose English is not their first language, their mm. second language, mm. trying to elicit something that he can put on the camera mm. in the way he wants it. And when he can't get it, 
he cuts and spl he cuts it to cuts make and splices it. it. Yeah, yeah. And she was also misrepresented um, by Fairfax in the newspaper. They said that she had um, said that she arranged a, a rally at Parliament House to welcome Li Keqiang because she wanted to drown out anti-Chinese Communist Party protests. And she never had said that ever. And as part of the settlement, settlement agreement, in the end it was settled. Um, the newspaper removed that line. It was no longer attributed to her. So essentially the, the legal action proved that ABC and Fairfax had defamed her. Absolutely. And they and settled with her. But quite dishonest. And not defamed. Sometimes you can defame sort of in a, almost an honest way. This was mm. deliberately, intentionally dishonest defame, defam, defamation. But it gets worse. The ABC got her to sign a non-disclosure agreement, of which course. means she can't talk about the injustice that she suffered. Now remember, it's the ABC that's spearheading this China threat campaign. Yep. That they're a threat to our democratic values. They're a threat to our freedom of speech. What about a non-disclosure agreement? You're using that. <laughs> Is that not a threat to free speech as well? It shows their hypocrisy. They mm. really don't care about free speech. No, no. And you're right. And the ABC's um, played a terrible role in this last few years. Um, I want you to... Ex there's another ca part of this case that's related um, that I wanted you to just reveal to the audience uh, some... Um, qualified legal opinions about some of the way the evidence that's alleged against China, um, some of the credibility of it, let put it that way. So um, there was a separate legal action taken because of that episode against Nick McKenzie and Fairfax by the Chinese business, the Australian Chinese businessman Chow Chak Wing, right? So there mm -hmm. was so there were two two legal actions essentially taken. Mm -hmm. It also he also won and on appeal. Mm -hmm. um, so what can you report about that, especially what the judge had to say about the credibility of some of these, these um, journalists? Um, I think a, a federal court judge was more damning of another case involving Chow Chak Wing, which was, um, again, similar accusations of, of him being falsely accused of engaging in espionage. But that was an article written by John Garneau, who was... Um, the political advisor to um, Malcolm Turnbull. Oh, okay. So the John the John Garno article was separate to the Four Corners thing, but the Four Corners episode did touch on that general those general allegations. But but this was separate legal action against Fairfax for just that article. Correct. Right. Correct. So John Garno was the advisor to Malcolm Turnbull, who Paul Keating famously accused of being the man who changed Australia's policy to be anti-China. Mm -hmm. Paul Keating singled out John Garneau. Mm -hmm. And John Garneau is also a one of the people who um, is very prominent at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, mm -hmm. of which we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. So, and he, and he often co-wrote some of his stuff with the same Nick McKenzie. Um, what did the judge have to say about John Garneau's credibility? Well, John Garneau's evidence did not work out well for him at all. <laughs> in the court. Uh, this is what Justice Wigney had to say. Um, he had doubts about Mr Garneau's reliability and credibility as a witness, concluding that Mr Garneau was prone to exaggeration and hyperbole, showed signs of arrogance if not smugness, and his answers became inappropriately dismissive, unresponsive, overly defensive or unhelpful. Uh, he, his Honour considered Mr Garneau's evidence in relation to his supposed insights into Dr Chow and the way he operated was, quote, far from impressive and that some of his conclusions about how Dr Chow operated appeared to be highly speculative and exaggerated, particularly given the relatively limited interactions he had actually had with Dr Chow and perhaps more significantly the relatively limited amount of actual research he had conducted and the relatively little objective information he appeared to have about Dr Chow. Um, his Honour also noted that Mr Garneau appeared to have been particularly awestruck by Dr Chow's wealth and privilege, to the point perhaps of being almost mildly obsessed or even infatuated, or at least in a professional sense, and that the attitude may well have coloured or clouded Mr Garneau's objectivity towards Dr Chow, and that Mr Garneau's evidence included some other rather extraordinary 
if not outlandish and paranoid statements or theories about Dr. Chow. That's really, really That's damning. damning. <laughs> yeah. Now, and I want the viewer to think about what this means. Here's somebody that we have identified as in like the top 10 um, figures in the media that have spearheaded this post-2016 push to push Australia down a hostile path against China. John Gar and not only was he in the media, he was in the government and part of this Aspie. And here's, you get to read their articles. The viewer gets to read their articles, Jack, right? And they, they you know, this is a, the, the Fairfax correspondent, et cetera, writing this. And of course you give the, because it's the Sydney Morning Herald, you give it a certain amount of credibility. When their claims are subjected to the scrutiny of a court in a legal action, this is an Australian federal judge's assessment of the credibility of one of their, these top people, mm. right? That tells you a huge amount about what we've been dealing with with this um, anti-Chinese propaganda. But before we move on, I think well, the, the answer what I'm going to ask you now, I think people need to also take this into account seriously when they, when they rethink this whole picture. We've already identified the Four Corners episode was the, the first real big investigative media push to make these allegations. What is the status of that Four Corners episode now? First, I just want to backtrack and I want to say that what was unique about that particular Four Corners story is that, and the reason why I was so engaged and wanting to get involved in dispelling the myths mm -hmm. that they were perpetuating was because it was, it was different. When I grew up watching the ABC, the message was, you got to watch out for those evil little Chinese commies over there in China. Yeah, yeah. In 2017, it changed to you got to watch out for the evil commies, Chinese commies here, here in, in Australia. Australia. Yeah. It was um, that's that was when McCarthyism was yeah. starting in 100%. 2017. Yeah. Which is which has gripped everybody now. We are in a McCarthy uh, frame of mind now in Australia. Absolutely. And this was the start of it. You're right. Yeah. But the irony of all of that is that the actual, the actual story is no longer online, it's being taken down because so much of it has been discredited and, and Chow Chuck Wing won his cases in court. And so the story that started all of this no longer exists, has been completely discredited and yet we're still talking well, yep. as if China, the China threat is real. Yep. Take that into account, people. This is stunning, but this is this is Australia in the 21st century. Mm. All right. Um, in 2018, uh, Jack, there's a Labor Party politician named Anthony Byrne, who um, was one of the anti-China agitators in Parliament. He called himself the Wolverines, and he was the deputy chairman of the of the Intelligence Committee of the Parliament. But this came out late, late last year that in 2018 he'd sent a text uh, message to colleagues boasting of his connection to Nick McKenzie, the, the person who did the Four Corners episode we're talking about, and he called the Four Corners stories on China hit jobs. That's what he called them in that um, text message. That's effectively an admission that it was propaganda, right, by this top anti-China politician. So you've called your website countering Western propaganda, co-West Pro, countering mm. Western propaganda. Um, how widespread do you think the propaganda is? Uh, it is absolutely widespread. Um, it's, it's widespread across different areas and it's widespread across time. Um, and I'll just give you a bit of backstory about me and, and yeah. why I'm interested in yeah. propaganda and encountering Western propaganda in particular, like labelling it yeah. Western propaganda. There's a reason for that. So there were two pivotal moments in my life when I was younger, when I was a teenage girl, that really um, brought about a heightened awareness of propaganda in the West. And one of those was the Children Overboard scandal. Um, so I've mentioned that uh, my mother is Iranian, yeah. but born in Iraq. So she's, she considers herself Iraqi Iranian. And uh, when the story came out, that uh, John Howard was saying that 
Iraqi refugees on the boat were throwing their children overboard into the ocean to gain asylum in Australia as a ploy. Um, I was in the lounge room watching it at the time. My mum was standing there. And, uh, you know, I was shocked and it was abhorrent to me that these people were acting like animals. Yeah. But my mother didn't react that way. She just said, this is a lie. This is a lie. This is not true. And she turned to me. I know the Iraqi people. They would never do this. I would never do this to you. I would never throw you in the ocean in that sort of situation. You've got to believe me. Mm. And I didn't believe her because I thought it's, it's our government, it's the media, the Western media, we can trust them. They tell the truth. Yeah, they tell the truth. Maybe there's propaganda in the Middle East. That's what my mum's used to, but it doesn't happen here. Mm. And she wouldn't accept that. So she dragged me off to all of her friends, all of her right. Iraqi friends, right. going from family to family, getting them to convince me that my mother would never do that to me. <laughs> and there was, I remember one Iraqi guy with, with both hands out begging me not to believe it. He says, you think that we only have propaganda in Iraq? We've got, you've got it here too, don't you know? <laughs> and, and I was looking to his wife and she was holding on to her baby and I could see that she was hurt by this news, right. but I still didn't believe them. And it wasn't until the media revealed what had really happened that I was just, I felt so much guilt and so much pain um, because I had a prejudice. Yep. And that's why I didn't accept what they were telling me. Um, that, that shook me and it made me rethink how the media operates in Australia. Yep. So then a couple of years later, when we had the weapons of mass destruction story, again, setting up a story to go, to justify a war in Iraq, a country that forms part of my cultural heritage. Yeah. Um, I was very skeptical when I heard that. I just thought possibly it's, it's a lie and it turned out that mm. it was. And of course, we now know that the first Iraq war was started on a lie as well, the incubator story. Um, so, when you've got that mixed ethnicity and that mixed cultural heritage in you, you form a different opinion to yes. the ordinary Australian. Um, how I saw a country that formed part of my heritage being demonised, or the people being demonised, um, really shook me and, and got me um, more guarded against what the media was saying, except for China. I just took it for granted right. <laughs> that everything that was said about Which China... Which is very common, actually. Yeah, until I went there and realised, oh, yeah. it's just kind of like how they portray Iraq. It's not true. Okay. So um, I guess it was meant to be. It was inevitable that I was eventually going to go into the field of debunking Western propaganda. And a lot of people don't like that term, um, that I'm singling out Western propaganda when it happens everywhere. And the reason why I do is because of the things that my mother said and, and her friends, which is Western propaganda is far more sophisticated than mm. what we have in the Middle East or what, what there is in China. You don't see it. You don't see it coming. You don't recognise it. Um, and that's what makes it more dangerous. So that's why I set up CoWest Pro Consultancy to deal with this. Look, there's a few jokes that have come up over the years about this. One is the, the difference between a state-controlled media and a so-called free media is the people in the, under the state-controlled media know they're being lied to. Hmm. The, yeah. other, the other yeah. one is, uh, I'll stuff this one up, but there's a famous exchange of, a, of a, 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 an academic who um, meets a guy, a, a Western guy, and he, uh, an American, and he says, oh, I've just come back from the Soviet Union where I've been studying Soviet propaganda, and now I'm coming to America to study American propaganda, and the American says, what propaganda? Mm. Mm. <laughs> right? Um, this is, it is, it is much more sophisticated. But we're now going to talk about a piece of it, because you have used your um, website to great effect, and you've produced an excellent report. Uh, and with the, you know, I, in, you know I'm, I'm hoping the viewers understand why I wanted to spend so much time letting you tell your background, because... We've called this interview the, the Aussie woman scaring the Western war propaganda machine. 
Um, and people need to know what qualifies you to even be interested in this area, let alone do what you do, right? So let's talk about that now, because you, um, this is the big issue of the, of the, of the, the, the current period of, of tension between the, the West and China, which is the so-called mistreatment of the Uyghurs. Um, and you have, <laughs> you've done a real number on a big claim that's been made. So in 2020, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Australia, which, you know, as people who are familiar with it know, it's funded by the Australian government, but also the United States State Department, um, the British government, the Japanese government, the Dutch government, um, and military um, weapons manufacturing companies, right? That, that's who funds uh, ASPE. So they produced a report called Uyghurs for Sale. And the lead author was this Australian Chinese dissident, Vicky Shu. And she's the, the woman that I tried to ask questions of a few weeks ago. And she was assisted by um, one of the other authors is Nathan Rusa. And um, I wanted to mention him because we're going to uh, contrast some of your photos with his photos, I think. Um, now, at the time they produced this in 2020, we had a look at it in the Citizens Party in our magazine. And one of our researchers, Milsa Harrison, did an initial look at the report and, and went to the sources and said, well, the text of the report says this, but the source doesn't say that, mm -hmm. right? And so we, we did a two-page article, which I remember talking to you about the first time I met you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's we just took that approach. You, however, Jack, took a very different approach. And in the process of doing that, you've produced what I and many others regard as the most definitive refutation of the ASPE report. Um, so you called your paper, I've got a copy here, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute's Uyghurs for Sale Report, Scholarly Analysis of Strategic Disinformation. Um, so yours was a legal analysis of the ASPE report. Um, so first, what legal qualifications do you have? I held an honours degree in law, a graduate diploma of legal practice. Um, I'm currently enrolled in a Masters of Law specialising in international law and I've been admitted as a lawyer to the ACT Supreme Court. And um, something that I've only just recently found out about you, you also, in your career, you've actually played, paid close attention to, you've worked with, this, with the people who scrutinise Australia's laws. In, in regards to terrorism, etc. You've had some experience of doing that. Uh, not working. Uh, my honours thesis and master's thesis was on counter-terrorism law, yes. Right, which is, what, which is very relevant to this subject. Um, so what motivated you to look at this report, the, this ASPE report? Well, when it first came out in 2020, I just quickly glanced through it and I could see that it was problematic, that it wasn't high quality research. But I figured someone in Australia, some sort of think tank or government department would would point out the problems with it, or or even the Chinese government or a think tank in China would. And I waited and I waited and, and nothing happened. And in the meantime, this became um, a powerful force in in the anti-China rhetoric. About a year after it was published, because uh, I do a bit of freelance legal research work on the side. Uh, someone in China had reached me through an intermediary asking, he, he explained to me that he owns a company in China. Um, he just had to sack all of his consensual Uyghur workers and lost all of his purchaser contracts because of the ASPE report and he wanted to know if I could help him find a law firm that could sue ASPE in an Australian court. And when I got that news, that was when I realised oh wow, this is, this is real, this is really hurting people on the yeah. ground there in China. And um, I just became invested in, in his story and I, and I wanted to do more than just hand him over to a law firm. I wanted to prepare something like this report to give to the law firm so that they're fully aware of all the issues. Um, so what I ended up doing was... And Melissa Harrison of the Australian Citizens Party, she just looked at the general claims. Yep. I went to the specific claims in the case studies because that's where the probative value of the evidence was going to be. And um, I remember it took a long time to come up with a, a structure that was easy for people to understand because the Uyghurs for Sale report is just such a mess. And I had to try and add order to the chaos. So mm. 
eventually I came up with the structure of um, looking at what the legal problems were and then even though it sh there were many legal problems with it, I sh it should have ended there, the discussion should have ended there, but nevertheless I, I moved it on to then a merit analysis, like looking at the um, logicality of what was said in the arguments that they made and then moving on from there, like um, parts of it that did make sense, um, moving it onto an evidentiary analysis, so comparing their claims against the evidence in their footnotes. Um, shall I go on to talk about what well, I found? Just, yeah, can I just, just clarify though, back to when you said the legal analysis, you're basically, um, when you said the legal problems, you were taking the fact that Aspie says forced labour and you were saying, well, forced labour is a, is a crime defined under international law and does this, the, do these allegations meet that definition of forced labour? Well, the problem was, it's really, un, it's, an, it's such an unusual report. They didn't put the legal definition of forced labour into the report. They tucked it away in an endnote, probably because it didn't help their arguments. And instead, they seemingly substituted it with something called the ILO indicators, International Labour Organisations Indicators yeah. of Forced Labour, which are just supposed to be on the ground clues to the possibility of forced labour maybe occurring. And the way it was presented, it looked like it was a legal checklist. It looked like it was an incredibly broad legal definition, if you could call it that. So um, it would make things that were innocuous or, or workplace circumstances that were just substandard, as if it was forced labour. Yep. Such things as um, a Uyghur woman washing her hair every day gets funneled into forced labour. A woman quoting Xi Jinping saying happiness comes from the struggle yeah. is funneled into this forced labour narrative. Um, Uyghur workers taking nighttime classes to learn Mandarin is an indicator of forced labour, but also the fact that they can't speak Mandarin seems to be an indicator of forced, forced labour. <laughs> it was just, it was yeah. a ridiculous report and I resented that I had to do a serious analysis of it because in everyday life I would just chuck it in the bin. But nevertheless, I had to um, take a very clinical and forensic approach to this. But that, because of how they presented it, my hands were tied behind my back. I couldn't measure their claims against the legal definition because they didn't use the legal definition. Right. So okay. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll use your structure, I'll use your framework, we'll use the ILO indicators. But even then, the claims didn't stack up. So this is, so the ILO indicators are just indicators. They're just, what is there, 11 of them or something? Mm -hmm. that, Correct. That um, people are investigating this, they're supposed to say, okay, well, if, there's that, if that's there, we should look a bit harder. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And ASPU presents it as anything that looks like that comes under the definition of forced labour. Mm. But that is not actually what forced labour is. No, no, and it's this, got a very narrow definition. Yeah, so, so uh, think about that when you hear the term genocide, by the way. <laughs> This is, these are the same people that throw the label genocide at China. They can't even they can't even use the proper definition of forced labour, let alone genocide. Mm. Um, so they they make up. I think there were eighteen allegations in the report. How many of them even related to forced labour? Anything like forced labour? They tried to make all of them relate to forced labour, seemingly, uh, but not a single one of them stacked up. And and that was a surprise to me. And at you the assumed end, they had something. Yeah. And, <laughs> And I thought, who's going to believe me if I say not a single accusation doesn't stack up? And I was going back and looking for a reason to push it over the line, and I, and I couldn't. Did they prove any of the cases? Uh, no, n not in my opinion. Um, in, in terms of getting close to the legal definition, so where they referred to involuntary labour, yeah. there are three cases that they referred to. Um, one was... Taekwong Shoes, a company in Qingdao. Taekwong Shoes did do its own audit and found that there was no forced labour, but nevertheless, they sacked all of their Uyghur workers because of the pressure that they were facing. Um, Foxconn Technology was also accused of using forced labour, uh, overtime, forced overtime labour. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and wow, that's a, that's a stretch. 
I mean, forced I'm, overtime. Forced over, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of workers in Australia that have had, you know, the boss has been in a tough situation. We need you to work overtime. Yeah, yeah, I take your point. Um, <laughs> but what was extraordinary about that accusation was that they, they had a, an, a newspaper article to back up their claim. And yes, it quoted some report from China Labor Watch, uh, which has some dodgy fun funding. But putting that aside, also in that newspa newspaper article, there was an outright denial from Foxconn Technology, but also its purchaser company, Apple. They've gone in, they've looked at it, there is no forced labour. And that was left out of the ASPE report. They excluded the, the that evidence. The denial was left out? Yes. The, de yeah. the denial in the name of, which company was that again? Uh, the, the biggest company in the world, <laughs> Apple. Yeah. And this yeah. American-funded think tank leaves that denial out of this report? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. How's that for bias? Yep. Yeah, this is what Aspie does. You stir me, see, you get me into trouble because you stir me up with these. No, they get you into trouble. I'm just pointing out the facts. <laughs> you, you pointed, you pointed yeah. it out to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, the third case of forced labour was um, HYP clothing. And that was a really interesting story that Aspie spun because they said that there was a high school in Joshua County that since 2017 had converted over to a internment camp and therefore you can assume that any graduates from that camp are in voluntary labour um, that, that are working for HYP clothing and the evidence that they used mostly to demonstrate this was a satellite image. There were some internal fences and some security checkpoints and that apparently is evidence of it being an internment camp. Now, if you've been Verified by a young man in his early 20s at Aspie named Nathan Rusa, who's supposedly the world expert in all this. Who also, my understanding, did not even have a bachelor's degree at the time of writing this. So uh, Nathan Rusa circled the little checkpoints and the fences and said, there you go, we've got an internment camp there. If you've been to China, you would know that security checkpoints are, are everywhere. And renovations are going on all the time. There are always internal fences everywhere. That doesn't mean anything. Then also, uh, Rusa claimed that uh, because the student population increased 650% from 2013 to 2019, that is also proof that this is an internment camp. Well, no, it's not. Because when you look at the satellite imagery all the way back to 2012, which is what I did, you could see that the school hadn't uh, been built yet. It was still under construction. Oh. It wasn't finished until 2013. And it figures that over a space of years, as, as the buildings get fitted out, as the surrounding area, the surrounding suburbs um, build up, yep. you're going to increase the student population. That's a more rational explanation than it being a concentration camp. Um, is this the one you've got photos of in your report? Yes, yes. I, I went online um, after I listed the satellite imagery. I went online just to see if I could find on the ground photos of this so called internment camp. And all I saw was a, a typical vocational high school. They teach hairdressing, they teach sewing, they teach cooking, mechanics. Um, it, it just looks like fun. <laughs> and, they're, and they're smiling in the photos. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It looks like a great school to be in. Yet, um, uh, in, in the exchanges we've had with some of these organisations pushing this stuff in recent times, like Human Rights Watch and mm -hmm. Sophie McNeil, um, they're very indignant when anyone, whenever anyone talks about the terrorism context of this whole Xinjiang um, program the government set up. But Sophie McNeil, I even heard her on Sky News two days ago, insisting that this is the greatest incarceration of people for their religion since the Holocaust. That's what sh that's the language she's using to describe what you're seeing in those in these photos. It just doesn't fit. No, it doesn't, and I um, I don't know what motivates Sophie McNeil or Human Rights Watch. Um, I can't I can't really comment on that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well. What have you concluded? You did a lot of work on this and put a, and I, I really take my hat off to you because it takes extraordinary individuals being prepared to do self motivated work like this that, to shape history, frankly. From all the work you've done, what have you concluded 
about Aspie's intentions. So the title of my paper is, is it a scholarly analysis or is it strategic disinformation? And I concluded the latter because I thought you cannot possibly get 18 claims so wrong. You can't be that incompetent. Yeah. There has to be another agenda going on here. Um, I am in the throes of trying to help the companies named in the report launch a lawsuit in Australia against Aspie, as well as the Uyghurs who lost their jobs. And I'm in conversations with the law firm that will be doing it. And my understanding is that they will be alleging that Aspie was motivated by malice in producing this report. And that has definite legal implications. Absolutely. Um, you did a second report, Jack, as under the CoWest Pro uh, banner on the allegations made by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Um, that one you called Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which is false Xinjiang labour claims, junk research or noble cause corruption. Um, what was the gist of that report? So the Aspie report was mainly concerned about the poverty alleviation scheme in Xinjiang and, and the worker la labour mobility program, right, yeah. uh, moving labour outside Xinjiang to where the work actually is. Um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch were concerned about uh, the de-radicalisation programs that were going on in Xinjiang. Um, there's some overlap between the two reports, but the Amnesty International Human Rights Watch report is definitely not as bad as the Aspie report. Nevertheless, there are still significant problems with it. Um, opaque research methodology, um, unclear legal applications, unreliable evidence, you know, hearsay of hearsay, yeah, yeah. anonymous testimony, um, that sort of thing. Um, in the end, I concluded it was most definitely, their reports were most definitely junk research. That's a term that I borrowed from, from the wrongful convictions field, which pins a lot of wrongful convictions on junk science. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, right. So yeah. I, I took that term and called it junk research. That right. junk research can also result in false yep. human rights abuse allegations. Yep. Um, whether it was... Um, a form of corruption, what I call noble cause corruption. Again, that's a term that I took from the wrongful conviction field, which is just uh, people involved in these matters using an ends justifies the mean cal means calculation to um, misrepresent evidence or, or misrepresent facts. I didn't go that far. I left it open to possibly concluding that these two NGOs were engaged in noble cause corruption, possibly, but at minimum, it's junk research that they've put out there. So, and now we have the um, UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights report is mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. um, will you also respond to that? And do you have any thoughts so far? Um, due to the amount of requests I've received to do <laughs> a legal analysis of that report, I probably will do that. But it takes up a huge amount of resources, which is why I was initially reluctant. But yeah, I'll probably look into it. I have read it. Again, it's not as bad as the Aspie report, but it has problems like the Amnesty International Human Rights Watch report does. Um, well, we, other, we're, other we're starting to get a sense there was a real struggle behind the scenes about this report. We don't know the full story yet, but there's there's evidence of that. So it's interesting. There's 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 sort of almost competing claims sometimes in in this report. So you're right. It's not as bad. But the, the Aspie crowd have grabbed hold of it to say this, this vindicates us, except funnily enough, <laughs> the report you debunked so thoroughly, mm. Uyghurs for Sale, is not referenced. Although, uh, other, uh, get, correct me if I'm wrong, it does cite other Aspie evidence. Mm -hmm. And maybe you should talk about Nathan Roos's tweets. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't cite the Uyghurs for Sale report, which did more than any other report yeah. to... to, to, to um, project this forced labour narrative. Yeah. So, um, yeah, did you want to say something about the evidence it did cite, like Nathan Roos's tweets? <laughs> well, it is extraordinary that um, the Uyghurs for Sale report is put out there as the quintessential report that proved the case of forced labour, and then it doesn't make it into the UN yeah. report. That's saying something. Um, 
Well, I think you did real damage to it. That's what it tells me. I would like to take credit for that. <laughs> um, in regards to another part of the report where they refer to and Rusa tweets. <laughs> That's just bizarre. Like in academic scholarly work, you don't refer to someone's Twitter thread as an authoritative source of evidence. Of evidence. Mm. Um, and that alone just uh, brings down the credibility of the UN report. Yeah. Uh, but there's more problems than that, but uh, people are yet to that. find out what they are. All right. Where are you hoping all this work leads, Jack? This is uncharted territory, what I'm doing. Co-West Prairie Consultancy is uncharted territory. Um, I'm just kind of playing it by ear and seeing where it takes me. I will continue putting out these reports, um, but they're not as impactful. They're not as powerful as launching lawsuits. We saw that with the Loop in Lou case. Yep. After she got her settlement, we didn't really hear too much about uh, Chinese student spying going on in Australia. Same with Chao Chuck Wing, when he won his lawsuits, he hasn't really been presented as someone engaging in espionage um, by the media. Yeah, right, yeah. The same thing's got to happen here with the Uyghurs for Sale report. I want Co West Prairie Consultancy to help coordinate and arrange a lawsuit against ASPE um, to get the truth on the record, to get justice for the victims and to hold ASPE accountable. And if you can do that, it'll go a long way, as you said, to debunking one of the big lies of the last period mm. that has shaped people's um, views of China. Yes. How can people support you? Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone who's given me donations. Um, some, people, some people have been incredibly generous and I've had $1,000, $2,000 checks come my way. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, if you'd like to continue to support my work, um, you can go to my website, cowestpro.co. Um, there's a link there to my GoFundMe page. And I'll keep putting out these reports. And the funds will mostly cover my travels to China to um, conduct a field study and to coordinate a lawsuit here in Australia. But I also would say if you want to support me, support the Australian Citizens Party as well because these guys are giving me a platform where no other mainstream media organisation or mainstream political party will do that. And um, I didn't put her up to this. <laughs> <laughs> you can support the Australian Citizens Party by subscribing to their weekly newsletter um, and you can learn a lot about um, all the propaganda that they debunk, not just about China but about other global South nations as well. Well, thank you very much for that. And I do, I do encourage the viewer, please get behind uh, Jack's work because she has done it. You have done it as an individual, mm. right? And uh, when I met Jack, I'm, I'm representing an organisation. I met this extraordinary individual and I enjoyed meeting your dad. Um, but you've, you've been so personally motivated. And when I heard all the story, I, as I said to you, the day I, the day I met you, I said, I want to interview this woman because <laughs> Australians need to hear this story. And then since then, all this, all the um, debunking of Aspie's forced labour report um, has come out subsequently, and I've, I've been able to help amplify your message on that, which has been quite good, even to the point of getting myself in a tad of trouble. But well, as you know, <laughs> I was reluctant to do this because there's no gain from it. Yeah, there's yeah. only grief. That if you're um, challenging the status quo on this China threat mm -hmm. narrative, you suffer in many ways, and you know how I've suffered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've just decided to um, to bite the bullet and come on the show today. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. And can I say, I, I'm honoured. This is a world exclusive. We're the first um, outlet that Jack has given an interview to, and I'm not just saying that to tick a box for the Citizens Party. I am honoured that you've done that, um, and I hope people take this show, share it widely, let everyone around the world hear this experience it's not just it's not just super rigorous analysis that jack does and it is rigorous that's why that's why she's destroyed the aspie Uyghurs for sale report but the background that you've heard her own experience that shaped her thinking every australian should most of us are not going to have a chance to go to china and have that experience so listen to someone who's prepared to tell you their experience and take on board that her experience means that most of what you've heard about China isn't true. 
right? And if we can take the heat out of this, maybe we won't go to war because ultimately, as you and I know, that's our motivation. We, a war is unthinkable, but the road to war is paved with lies. Mm -hmm. And our job is to debunk those lies. So, and Jack, you've done an incredible job doing that. Thank you for that and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. So to the viewer, thanks for tuning in. Please, like I said, help us share this widely. We will put relevant links down below that you can click on and, and uh, share as well, um, including how you support Jack. But the most important thing is sharing. Get this out everywhere um, because I think, yeah, especially in the context that the whole world is now debating this UN report and um, Jack has fired a shot across the bow here. Um, so thanks for tuning in and tune in next time for more of Citizens Insight.